that boy ain't right. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily Reddit content. And today, we are jumping back into, yes, you guessed it, probably, I mean, from the title. <laughs> it's r slash Tales of Neckbeards, which is closely related to r slash Neckbeard Stories. It was basically an interim subreddit while Neckbeard Stories was down, but uh, it still gets used from time to time. And it is in fact home to one of the uh, more well-known, I suppose, Neckbeard Sagas, suggested to me by Miss Unamused Nerd, who I know for a fact really enjoys these Neckbeard stories. So today we are going to be delving into the saga of Pajama Beard. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump right into the saga of Pajama Beard. The Beard in the Striped Pajamas. To preface this, I've never posted on Reddit before, and I made this account solely to share my hellish summer experiences with a beard that I call Pajama Beard. I have more stories than this, and we'll type them up and post them if there seems to be an interest, but in the meantime, enjoy the cringe. The cast, me slash OP, a 17 year old straight female who has an unhealthy obsession with trout fishing, this will be important for later, I'll just refer to myself as October for this. Pajama Beard, a 22-year-old straight male, who wears those shirts with the howling wolves on them, you know the ones. Dan, the boss man, he owns the lodge I work at and was often a witness to my encounters with the Pajama Beard. This summer started off in a typical way by my personal standards. I get out of school, it's my junior year going into senior year, I pack up my truck, and I drive four hours to a little camp nestled in the eastern Sierras where I work and live for three months during the summer, cleaning cabins and running a tiny bait and tackle shop. It's a beautiful place that lies beneath the Palisades Glacier with the cleanest, coldest water that you will ever drink. Heavenly. This place is my safe haven, a refuge if you will, from a somewhat tumultuous home life. A place where I can make money, fish, and be totally cut off from the outside world, as there's no cell service up there, with zero disturbance or distractions. However, this summer was destined to be one that was extremely trying thanks to none other than a neckbeard, who I have deemed Pajama Beard. I had just gotten to the campsite, and quite literally had just been handed the keys to my small summer cabin by Dan, when I noticed a very large RV crossing the small bridge over the creek headed towards the campground. I mean, this sucker was huge. The full package, it seemed. Must have cost an arm and a leg. Dan turns to me and says, October, get your stuff unpacked and get settled in. I'm gonna watch this dumbass try and bring that behemoth in here. <laughs> I simply reply with, alright, and head back to my truck so that I could pull in next to cabin 2, the one that I would be staying in. But by the time I'd hopped up into the driver's seat and turned the key in the ignition, the look on Dan's face had gone from enthused to downright dumbfounded. The massive RV wasn't pulling into the campground. It was attempting to pull into the small circle drive in front of the tackle shop where guests come to check in. These asshats weren't campers, they were lodging in one of the cabins. Realizing quickly that I would be in the way of this monster, I pulled up the brake, put the truck in drive, and hurried to my cabin. The unpacking process went uneventfully, as I'm pretty good at packing light and make sure to be very organized. However, I could not say the same for the remainder of that day. Seeing as I didn't start officially working until the next day, and therefore hadn't been paid, I hadn't bothered to buy fresh groceries yet, I had canned stuff, but nothing perishable, I decided that I would take the opportunity to go fishing so that I could have rainbow trout and hash for dinner. So I rigged up my pole, tied up my boots, and tied my knife to the loops in my jeans where a belt would go, and set off to catch dinner. At first the fishing was uneventful, and typical of creek fishing, I'd caught two decent rainbows when, while crawling through the brush toward a clearing, I noticed a flash of blue and green fabric run by. By run, I mean, at best, a brisk walk. Once I'd stood up, my eyes unknowingly beheld what would be the bane of my existence for the next three months. There, about 15 yards in front of me, stood Pajama Beard, in green and blue striped pajama pants that were about three sizes too small, and a graphic wolf tee with an image of a wolf howling at a full moon on the edge of a cliff. Classy. <laughs> the sunlight had caught the top of his head, giving his ratty looking black hair an unholy greasy shine, and when he turned towards me I saw what looked like pube hair haphazardly glued to his rotund chin, 
and I kid you f not, a full unibrow. Noticing my apparent shock, Pajama Beard drew nearer and spoke in an obviously fake deep voice. What's a fair girl like you doing out here in the woods all by herself? No one had ever questioned what I was doing there before, even in a rhetorical way. Anyone with a quarter of a brain cell would be able to tell very quickly that, uh, I was fishing. I replied shortly, fishing, then asked why you're running around in the woods in pajamas. There's stinging nettle around here, you know. He retorted with, A man like me has nothing to fear from the woods, especially with my abilities. It took every fiber of my being not to bust myself up laughing. <laughs> this 5 foot 8, 300 pound butterball in f pajamas had nothing to fear in the woods with no internet to save him? <laughs> yeah, right. But I held myself together and replied simply, okay. But seriously, be careful. Eleven hikers have died up here in the past few years because they were caught unprepared. Oh, I'll be fine, Pajama Beard said, still making the shitty fake deep voice. After all, they were all probably just human. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I stopped walking for a moment, floored by what this guy had just uttered. Stopping was a huge mistake. I could smell him before he reached me. Major B.O. Even over the smell of salmon eggs and trout, I could smell him, and the pungency was ungodly. He spoke again, keeping up with my now hurried pace to escape his foul-smelling range. For any normal man, harsh snow or surviving in the woods would be a problem. I could hear him sort of huffing as he walked, and faking a deep voice will do that to the obese. But I'm not just any man, so it's not a problem for me. Like I said... I have abilities. Is one of those abilities an inability to breathe through your nose? <laughs> Mouth breather. I asked, trying not to laugh at my own joke. I do that too much for my own good. He seemed stunned by my crack, almost as if he couldn't believe the fair lady had dared to question him. I'll have you know, he said, awkwardly grabbing my shoulder with his meaty hand and physically spinning me around. I am a lichen. You'll regret saying that, I swear. You better hope I'm not hungry tonight. I wish this wasn't what he said, but it was. Verbatim. <laughs> Dude's probably always hungry. I could say nothing, I just stared in sort of disbelief, then removed his clammy hand from my innocent shoulder and hurried back to my cabin. After reaching my cabin and firmly locking the door, I observed through a window, Pajama Beard waddling toward a cabin, the one which the Overkill RV had pulled up next to, the one that I would surely have to clean by Friday, or so I thought. In my head, I imagined the smell of a week's worth of festering B.O. built up in there and gagged. Blech. That evening, when I went out the back to clean the two trout I had caught, I swore I heard someone's weak attempt at a howl in the nearby woods, and I do mean weak. I did my best to ignore it, still confused about what had happened to me earlier. After cleaning the trout, I lugged the water bucket, now full of trout innards and blood, toward the wood's edge, away from the cabin so that the wasps wouldn't disturb the guests. As I dumped out the bucket at the base of a large pine, I saw out of the corner of my eye none other than Pajama Beard, eyeing me from behind a large pine, except it wasn't quite large enough as his belly was clearly visible from my angle. <laughs> even after he ducked behind it. Deciding in that moment that I wanted revenge for the cringe interaction and weird threat earlier, I grabbed my knife and removed it from its holster, then proceeded to smear it with the bloody trout guts that I had poured out at the base of the tree. This isn't a small knife, mind you. Then, as quietly as I could, I stalked over to the large pine where Pajama Beard was hiding, creeping towards the tree till I could hear his heavy mouth breathing. And I said aloud, what the hell do you think you're doing running around in the woods in the dark? I said this while simultaneously whipping around the tree, bloody knife gripped tightly in my hand. Pajama Beard was already quite the pale fellow, but he looked like a ghost now, even in the waning light. Without a word, he turned on his heel and waddled for his life back towards the cabins. So much for being a big strong werewolf with abilities, right? This was my first day and first encounter with Pajama Beard. There's a lot more. And they get even more cringy as time goes on. 
as eventually the beard would decide that he wanted me to be his mate. Oh, God. <laughs> However, I was, and still am, in the same long-term relationship, but he would still try to win me over with his wolfish charm, even when that boy came up to visit me. Edit. Eight commenters is more than enough for me to be motivated to share another story, so I've decided to go in chronological order. With some measure of luck, a second encounter will be out tonight. I have so many that I may have to cherry pick. After all, it was a virtually three months of this guy being a worthless rat. Pajama Beard Encounter 2. That's not a gummy worm. Since my first Pajama Beard post attracted some attention, I present to you my second noteworthy encounter with the Pajama Beard. For reference, this is only 48 hours after the encounter detailed in my first Pajama Beard post. The cast, me slash OP, October, 17 year old female who enjoys elk jerky, again, important to future stories. Pajama Beard, PB, a 22 year old male werewolf who was determined to fill my life with autism. <laughs> uh, that's cold. It got me good, but it's cold. <laughs> Pajama Beard's mom, the overweight middle aged white woman who spawned our neckbeard friend. Unfortunate. Dan, owner of the lodge and cabins, aka my boss. Lodge is in quotes because it's nothing more than a foundation due to an avalanche and then a fire. The lodge was rebuilt five times before they gave up on it. Ooh, Dan must have some money, huh? <laughs> Two days after my arrival at my summer job, aka my first encounter with Pajama Beard, I'd begun working as the cashier in the tiny bait and tackle shop at the main camp. Yes, I'm aware that according to California state law this is illegal, and no, I don't care. My job here is pretty simple. I ring people up and try to sell them somewhat overpriced fishing bait and snacks, or sometimes try to sell them firewood. All goes fine for about two days. The shop is open from 9am to 3pm, but for an hour before and an hour after I run the little shop, I do any cabin cleaning or grounds maintenance that Dan asked me to do. Also around noon to 1 o'clock, which is my lunch hour, I fish. The third day begins typically. Cabin 13 needed to be cleaned, so I scramble over there and scrub that bitch top to bottom. As guests arrive at 11am, and I do the cleanup slash prep. Due to the strange arrangement of the cabins, 13 is only a small privacy line of trees away from cabin 17, the cabin in which Pajama Beard and his parents are residing. Oh, he does live with his parents. That makes sense. Well, I haven't seen Pajama Beard since I spooked him two days earlier, so I think nothing of it and continue doing my job. Unfortunately, as I'm rushing to leave 13, I was running about 10 minutes behind because the stove was really nasty. I glanced over at 17. Shouldn't have done that. I noticed that one of 17's shades is pulled back, 17 has two nice big front windows, and I can just make out the pudgy figure staring at me. Knowing full well who it was, I look away and increase my already fast pace to the tackle shop's rear mudroom slash the closet in which we keep all the cleaning supplies. The morning before my lunch break goes by uneventfully. I end up dusting most of the shop because stuff is so rarely purchased there that it gathers dust and no one wants to buy dusty chips, sealed or not. I sell a bundle of firewood to someone who had come up from the campground though, so that was good. 12 o'clock rolls around and I take my break. I decide to make myself some mac and cheese back at my own cabin. Crab mac and cheese, yum. And note at this point, I still haven't driven into town to buy any fresh groceries. After eating, I fish the stream for a while. I head down through the campground, then back up, and I end up catching my limit in about 30-ish minutes. I found two really nice holes with a bunch of hungry trout in them. On my way back, I stop by my cabin briefly to put my catch in a bucket of cold water and grab some of the homemade elk jerky that had been given to me by a family friend. I walk towards the shop entrance, and my mood takes an immediate 180. Standing at the door to the shop, waiting for me, is pajama beard. Damn thought to myself internally, thought I'd scared him off. He looks towards me, and in a droning voice, he's no longer trying to fake a deep voice. I've been waiting for 15 minutes. The sign says you open at 1 o'clock. Sorry, I reply bitterly. My dinner doesn't catch itself. I don't exactly recall what he said in response, but it was something having to do with how girls can't hunt and fish as well as men, or some crap like that. 
while he was talking, I noticed that he was wearing pajamas. Again. Oh yeah, I replied sarcastically while opening the door. I could smell him again real bad this time. I'm sure someone with your abilities is more than capable of providing your own food. Pajama Beard picked up on my sarcasm, and while I turned the lights back on and took my place behind the counter, he droned on about how his abilities were not something to joke about, and how he had only spared me two nights prior because I was a fair young maiden who had simply made a foolish mistake. And since he was so wise and merciful, he decided not to provide himself a human meal, and had instead elected to consume a young doe. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he got so doughy. <laughs> it's a dad joke. Never in my short sweet life thus far had I ever felt so much disgust and secondhand embarrassment at the same time. This guy both belittled and praised me in the course of a few sentences. Upon finishing his monologue, he came to the counter clutching a cherry Pepsi and three bags of Cool Ranch Doritos. I rang him up and he noticed the elk jerky sitting on the counter. I'd been snacking while he was babbling. How much? He asked in a stuffy voice. Not for sale, I replied, void of any emotion. I insist, he said, shoving a wad of bills in my direction that smelled like a sunbaked porta potty. I cannot sell you my elk jerky, as it's homemade and not a store item, I reply, now growing agitated. Elk jerky? He asked questioningly, then staring at me with a newfound interest. While he was doing this, I was counting his change, though I could still smell his money on my hands. Oof. You like elk? He asked. Yeah, I said, better than beef. I see he said with that sort of creepy, fascinated voice. Well, if I can't have that, then I'll take a free gummy worm. He then proceeded to grab this gummy worm. Uh, sir, I said, trying to warn him. No, no, he cut me off, trying to be smooth. Call me Pajama Beard. Pajama Beard, I replied as quickly as he would allow. That's not a gummy worm. Too late. This experienced and skilled hunter had just chewed and swallowed a fucking mouse tail not a literal mouse's tail but a specific kind of trout bait <laughs> here's a picture of it that's trout bait the fearsome predator then went from ghostly pale to a shade of green and proceeded to speed waddle his way out of the shop <laughs> taking his kill of doritos and pepsis with him as soon as the door to the shop closed, I laughed the most hysterical laugh of possibly my entire life, and I couldn't stop until I started choking. The afternoon went calmly after that, until a shrieking voice filled my ear. Have you ever heard an angry stellar blue jay? Well, imagine that, except ear rape edition. That's what this woman sounded like. Dan then appeared in the shop doorway, and this lady was still screaming, your employee tried to kill my son. She fed him fish food. I was dumbstruck by what I had just heard. Dan then looked me dead in the eye and said, October, did you give this woman's son bait and say it was a gummy worm? I paused, still in shock at what I was hearing. I then, through gritted teeth, explained how Pajama Beard had ingeniously grabbed the bait from the jar on the counter and helped himself to its soft rubbery insides. The woman scoffed at me and called me a lying pig, then demanded that I apologize. Not wanting to be sent home only three days into my three-month work trip, I reluctantly apologized, first to Pajama Beard's mom, then to Pajama Beard himself, who had extremely red and watery eyes. <laughs> In my head, I thought, has this little been crying? <laughs> but I said nothing of it out loud, and instead I just shot him one of the dirtiest looks that I could muster. Once they were satisfied with my apology, they left, causing the building to shake a little. Dan, of course, asked me again what happened. I did my best to explain the entire event, starting with me opening the shop again late, all the way to Pajama Beard eating the mouse tail. <laughs> After all was said and done, Dan chuckled a little and let me off a few minutes early for the trouble, as he put it. In hindsight, I shouldn't have apologized. I should have let Dan fire me and send me home right then and there. Because after this event, Pajama Beard would go from gross and annoying to a persistent borderline sexual harasser who would make it his goal by the end of Summer's End to have me as his mate. 
All because he would take my love of elk, but all meats in general, really, way out of context. But that's for next time. Stay tuned for more tales of our sick, pajama-wearing, bait-eating wolf man. <laughs> oh. Pajama Beard, Encounter 3. Snowstorm Sucker Punch. Nice. My third encounter with our obese lichen friend, through which he exposes more of his mm, charming personality. <laughs> the cast. Me slash OP, October. 17-year-old, rough-and-tumble chick who enjoys fishing and food. Pajama Beard, PB, our dashing 22-year-old lichen who is built like a midget Michelin man. <laughs> Pajama Beard's mom, morbidly obese middle-aged white woman who smells only slightly better than her beard spawn. <laughs> Dan's son, we'll call him Jack. He's 25 and comes to help his dad run the camp on occasion, currently enrolled at a state school. It was Friday night, two days after the events detailed in my second encounter with Pajama Beard. Clouds had built in thick against the mountain that day, and for that entire week it dropped well below freezing at night. According to Dan, a storm was blowing in, and it was a 75% chance it would snow that night and into Saturday. Now, I'm no fool. When it comes to the outdoors, I know what I'm doing. I'd seen the clouds early that morning and busted out snow chains for my truck, as well as my bearskin gloves and heavy parka. Sudden snow in June is not uncommon in the eastern Sierras, and I could tell this was going to be a nasty one. This is what I was talking about when I mentioned 11 hikers had died in the past few years in the first encounter. The storms come out of nowhere. One day you're wearing shorts, the next you're in heavy snow gear. That's just how it is in the Sierras this time of year. However, Pajama Beard and his family were not so outdoor smart. They would be caught woefully unprepared in this last-minute snow blast from an otherwise very mild winter. Friday night, I decided to sleep in the living room, as the cabins are not at all insulated, and the heater is right there next to the couch. I removed my roll of biscuits from my freezer as well as some elk sausage, and put some gravy mix down from the little cupboard. I intend to warm myself up with biscuits and gravy in the morning, and then eat the rest for lunch and maybe breakfast the next day. I sleep in my light sleeping bag on top of the couch because that frickin' couch is gross. In the morning I wake up and I can feel the cold from the moment I zip down the side of my bag. Looking out the window, I can see that the snow has come down like icing on a Cinnabon cinnamon roll. Thick as all hell and piled waist deep. I mean waist deep from the perspective of someone who's 5 foot 4. I'm cold as f despite the heater trying its hardest, so I quickly get dressed and attempt to gather up my snow gear while the biscuits bake in the little hand light gas oven and the gravy heats with the sausage on top of the stove. I'm digging the ice spikes for my boots out of one of the bags when I hear a hard knock on my cabin's door. Okay, I thought. I don't start work for another 45 minutes. What's this about? To my surprise, it's Dan's son at my back door. I didn't even know he had come up. I open the door and I am blasted in the face with freezing air. Hey, can I come in? Jack asks. Yeah, sure. Hurry, it's cold, I say to him, and he clamors inside and shuts the door. Sorry, I know it's before your workday starts, October, but we need your help. I say nothing and look at him, so he continues. The people in cabin 17 came by early this morning, or at least the lady did, and said that they don't have any snow clothes, but we don't have any four-wheel drive on any of our cars to help them out, and their RV definitely won't cut it, so... They asked if you'd be willing to drive down to town and buy them some snow jackets and stuff. Obviously, they're paying, but you're the only one who can drive down there, so would you be willing to help us out here a bit? Dan says that he'll pay for the gas and the extra work hours. I want to scream at this point. These pricks that damn near got me fired three days prior now want me to drive down the mountain in the fucking snow and buy them shit because they're too fucking dimwitted to bring it themselves. Ugh. I know I had an attitude when I responded, and it wasn't aimed at Jack, but at that point, I couldn't help myself. Fine, I'll do it, but I'm eating my f***ing breakfast first. After my biscuits and gravy, I step outside. I now see why Jack came to my back door, as the front is piled with snow. I had forgotten to put down salt. I trudge over to the tackle shop, and confirm with Dan that it was indeed Cabin 17 that asked for the help. And of course, it was. 
Something to note, since we're up in the mountains, Dan offers a sort of pickup delivery service to the guests, permitting that they pay for whatever they want to be picked up. That way they can stay on the mountain and not have to worry about it. I'm sure if I had not been there, he would have regretted that hardcore on this occasion. I then make the reluctant walk over to cabin 17. I have a pen and pad shoved into my glove so I can write down exactly what they need. I knock on the door to the cabin, and after what seems like an eternity, the door swings open. In the doorway stands Pajama Beard's morbidly obese mother, who smells like hairspray and bacon, but not like the good hairspray, that shit from the 80s that makes a better flamethrower than it does hairspray. She ushers me inside, and I step in. My spikes give me an extra inch and a half of height, but even with that in mind, she still seemed tiny. The place smells like a homeless orgy. I mean... <laughs> I mean, just foul. Absolutely foul. There are wrappers and paper plates strewn about, and more empty soda bottles than floor space. I can smell food being cooked in the kitchen, the bacon has been burned for sure, and the faint hints of ham that I smell are definitely burned as well. When it comes to meat, I am a fucking bloodhound. You cannot hide that shit from me, especially if it's been overcooked, even a tad. The whale then opens her mouth and begins a list that seems almost never-ending of all the things that they need, beginning with the snow gear, then moving into food. And lots of food. I mean, 24 packs of soda and donuts as well as party-sized chip bags are on this ever-growing list. By the time she's finished, she's taken a seat on the couch and seems almost, dare I say, out of breath. I glance down at her and see something which I wish I hadn't. She's picking food crumbs out of her bra and eating them. <laughs> <laughs> and the action has caused her clearly too tight shirt to move up, exposing an enormous pale and bloated belly. Disgusting. I look up from this as quickly as possible and go over the list again, and she confirms that I have everything down. Then of course I ask for the money to buy this feast. She looks side to side and then screams, Pajama Beard, where's my purse? There's a moment of silence and then a response, In here, Bob, I'll bring it over. From the kitchen waddles Pajama Beard, wearing a shirt this time with a wolf growling. It's too small for him though, and like his mother, his belly too sticks out. His face looks like a grease trap, and he's stuffing himself with burnt bacon. Little bits of it have somehow managed to jump into his greasy unibrow. <laughs> his smell, however, is too much for the meat to mask, and he grows uncomfortably close to me, damn near spitting into my face as he says, So, we meet again. He then hands his mom the purse and declares, I have something to add to the grocery list. Alright, I respond. What do you want to add? He then gives me this shit-eating grin and says, JERKY! And nothing else. Uh, I respond mildly confused. Any particular type? No, he responded. I think I may have cringed because he was attempting to be sly. Whatever type the lady likes the best. I turned red. I know I did, but I wasn't embarrassed. I was livid. This f pig who almost had me fired was attempting to smooth things over with one of my favorite f snack foods. Little did I know he was trying to do more than just smooth things over. I said simply, okay, I think your ham is burning, and wheeled around and got the hell out of there as quickly as possible. I don't think I even shut the door. The drive down and shopping went smoothish. I got a lot of stairs with all that food in my cart and it was extremely awkward trying to explain why I was buying it to the cashier, but I survived. I had some trouble finding the clothes in the sizes they needed though, and ended up having to drive all the way to Bishop to find them. Beyond that, all was okay. I stopped at a place called Shat's Bakery and bought myself a loaf of sourdough bread and an apple pull-away cake. I also did my shopping while I was out. By the time I was headed back up the mountain, it was already past noon and I'd burned through half a tank of gas, so I just ended up filling up the tank. After all, Dan promised to pay for it. Upon my return to camp, I unloaded my groceries, and then ended up just driving my truck up to cabin 17, as there was simply too much shit to carry feasibly up to them. Surprisingly, the unloading process goes uneventfully, and for a second I thought I was actually in the clear, when, just as I'm about to leave, Pajama Beard's voice fills my unprepared ears. 
I think you forgot something, he said again. He had that grin on his face. I look down, and he's holding the bag of jerky I bought, and he extends his arm. Here, take it. it it's yours. No, thank you. I'm fine, I say quickly, and I then exit the cabin, because freezing my ass off in the snow is better than talking to this freak. <laughs> to my dismay, he follows me out and waddles after me through the snow, desperate to keep up. Finally, after he keeps persisting, I turn around. Dude, thanks. But I'm fine. Really. He catches up to me, and I can see very clearly that he's huffing now, as his breath is visible in the cold. Look, he says to me in almost a whisper. I know what you are, but I promise I won't tell anyone. I'm confused as fuck now and simply ask, what? He continues his whispery creep fest voice. I know you're like me, and that's why we get along so well before. He pauses. I'm speechless. I know I've invaded your territory, and as a clearly alpha female, you must see this as a threat, but I didn't mean to upset you or disturb you, so take this as a peace offering. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he stretched out his sausage arm, attempting to hand me the jerky. This time I accept his peace offering, stepping closer to him to grab it. He then says, You know, I think you and I should talk some more. Maybe come back up here and I'll show you the inside of my RV. I then, without any word or warning, give this man the hardest f <clears throat> gut punch that I have ever delivered to another human being until this day. Before he can cry or say anything, I take my peace jerky and leave. <laughs> I remember thinking that the sucker punch to the gut would finally be the end of our interactions. Boy oh boy, was I horrendously wrong. This beard who had somehow convinced himself that I too was a werewolf would from that moment forward simply be more inspired to take me for his mate. In hindsight, he must have been into BDSM or some shit because no one who's mentally stable would take a punch to the gut as I'm interested. But that's for the next installment in the Pajama Beard Encounters. <laughs> Pajama Beard Encounter 4 Hunt for Red October My fourth and shortest encounter with Pajama Beard that still managed to be extremely cringy. The cast Me slash OP October 17 year old rough and tumble female who enjoys fishing and food Pajama Beard PB A 22 year old lichen who has decided that I am the object of his desire Dan, my boss and the man who owns the lodge so, it's been an entire week since the events of Encounter 3, and I'm on top of the world right now. I caught my personal best stream trout two days after all the snow melted, three pounds, which is big for a stream fish, and I had been brining and smoking trout to sell in the bait and tackle shop. If you've never smoked rainbow trout, you're missing out, because if it's done correctly, it's honestly really good. But I digress. For that week, I was busy cleaning cabins, raking up infinite amounts of pine needles, and doing other general stuff around the camp. I'd gone down to town one more time in that week span to let my boyfriend and family know that I was indeed alive. And yes, I did have to clean Pajama Beard's cabin, and it took two hours longer than usual because an ungodly amount of soda had soaked into the carpets, and the stove was coated in grease. Surprisingly to me, my punch had gone unprotested, and Pajama Beard's mother hadn't come screaming to my boss. More than likely, Pajama Beard was too ashamed of himself to tell his mother that this mean girl punched him at the next Tuesday. At that point, I thought for certain he was gone, and I would never have to deal with his disgusting werewolf ass again. And I was right for that week, but that week only. It's a crisp Monday morning. I wake up early to fish and make my breakfast, and I watch a doe and her fawn eat grass that has grown into the foundation of that old lodge. I get a few really nice sunrise pictures of the glacier flooded with a pink light, and I make a tiny snowman from the very little remaining snow near the trout pond. All's right with the world, I suppose. And after fishing for a little while, I head over to the shop to talk to Dan about my work for that day. As it so happened, there were no cabins to clean for that day, and Dan was content running the shop, so he gave me the day to live a little. So that's just what I did. I packed myself lunch and geared up my hiking stuff, and went on a day hike to the first lake. It was beautiful. 
The glacial water is turquoise, and it's so peaceful up there that you almost forget that down the mountain road is a world full of people. By the time I make it back down to camp, it's mid-afternoon, and I'd gotten kinda hot in my hiking clothes, so I elect to change and just fish for the rest of that day. Should have stayed up on the mountain. I walk past the bait and tackle shop and overhear a conversation. There's also a somewhat nice BMW pulled up in front, and I hear a voice I almost recognize. The conversation I eavesdrop on goes as follows. Dan, she's an employee. I cannot give you my employee's information. Pajama beard. But we had a real connection, and she said you would give me her number. Dan, October never told me that. Pajama beard. Can't you just trust me and at least give me her email? Dan, not until she tells me herself that she wants me to, and that means she tells me face to face, not through you. Pajama beard. Well, then I'll just find her and ask her then. Dan, okay, good luck with that. She went on a hike today though. Pajama beard. Well, she has to come back down eventually. At this, I make a dash for my cabin and lock the doors. This creep was trying to get my number from my fucking boss. Ich. I change into less hot clothing and watch through my front window until after probably two hours, I finally see the BMW pull out of the drive and start to head down the road. Thinking that the coast was clear, I emerge and head towards the bridge to go fishing. I make it past the bridge where there's a small parking lot for hikers and to my horror, Pajama Beard is parked there, and it's too late. He's seen me. I make a beeline for the brush along the creek side, but I hear his voice, and due to the fact that I wasn't born in a barn, I stop. Pajama Beard. I've been hunting for you all day, October. OP, I never told you my name. Pajama Beard. Your boss told me that much, but he wouldn't do me a favor. OP, playing dumb. Uh, what was that favor? Pajama Beard. He wouldn't do me the honor of giving me your number. OP, my phone doesn't work up here. No one's does, so there's no point in that. Also, I'm not single. Pajama Beard, now seemingly enraged. So, you took my jerky that was bought with my money, fully knowing that you have a boyfriend? OP, I think you mean your mom's money. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> and yes, also just because it's yours doesn't mean I owe you anything. It was a gift. Pajama beard. But... And then a grossly long pause. I want you to be mine so badly. We're both lichens. We could have a family. And I would hunt and provide for you. And you'd stay at the den and raise pups. It would be... Perfect. <laughs> God, I'm cringing so hard. <laughs> oh! Okay, I'm just gonna let that statement soak in a little bit while I tell you a mini story. <laughs> My junior year, i.e. the year before this summer, I had an interesting experience with a group of lesbian weebos. Weeaboos? You see, they too were convinced that I was a werewolf, but for different reasons that they put together after a few months of my feeling bad for them and talking to them. Through the course of our conversations, they found out some things about me and compiled them into a sort of manifesto to prove my guilt of lycanthropy. The list was something like this. 1. I'm allergic to silver. I actually am, but it just makes my skin green and smell gross. 2. I'm colorblind. Again, I am. But it's just I have a reduced sensitivity to red light and I can still see some reds. 3. I like my meat raw. Okay, again, this wasn't wrong. I like beef tartare, but most of the time I like my steak blue, and yes, I do like sashimi. Four, I don't really sleep. This one was only kinda true, because at the time I was slam studying for an AP test. Five, I'm kinda hairy for a chick. This one is embarrassingly true as well. If I don't shave, then I have more hair on my arms than my boyfriend does. So yeah, this was a thing. And they spread this rumor about me to most of the junior class, and some people actually bought into their theory. I'm still awaiting my trial at Weeb Court. <laughs> Anyways, back to Pajama Beard. After his weird fantasy confession to me and his statement of wanting to make me his own, 
I simply said, you're fucking sick. <laughs> and hightailed it into the brush. Pajama Beard wasn't able to follow me, though I know he tried. And I, after crossing the creek again further down, was eventually able to escape him for the time being. Stay tuned to Pajama Beard Radio. In the next installment, I get a letter from our heartbroken Lichen Beard. <laughs> Pajama Beard Encounter 5 Lichen Love Letter. I get a gross letter from the beard, and the only solution is to kill it with fire. <laughs> The cast, me slash OP, October, is a 17-year-old female who loves fishing and food, and also is the unwanted recipient of Pajama Beard's affections. Pajama Beard, PB, 22-year-old male, self-proclaimed werewolf, who has convinced himself that I'm his soulmate. It's been a measly 72 hours since my last little run-in with the Pajama Beard, during which he confessed a rather disturbing fantasy to me. After that run-in, I was a little unsettled. If that guy was crazy enough to say that kind of thing to an almost stranger, then he may not have any conscience at all not to take it a step further next time. I decided to provide myself a better means of self-defense. Now, as a note of clarity here, I'm by no means a gun nut. I have this gun simply for self-defense and nothing else. The gun in question here is a Smith & Wesson 22 Long Rifle CTG. 22 refers to the caliber, and CTG means cartridge, and Smith & Wesson is who made it, for those who don't already know. Also, contrary to what the name may suggest, it is not a rifle, but a revolver. This is what you might call a true lady's gun. 22 is a small caliber round, making it easier for someone with smaller hands and a weaker grip to fire accurately, which is why I own this particular model. Now, the legal age to own a handgun in the lovely state of California is 21, which means it's entirely illegal for me to have this in my possession, but I'm not a total dumbass, and I understand this, so I simply move the gun from a well-hidden spot in my truck, where it resides, to its case by my nightstand, so it's there, but well out of sight. Doing this makes me feel substantially better, and I'm back to myself in no time. So, like I said, it's three days later, and I'm feeling good, washing sheets, and probably inhaling too much Windex while cleaning cabin 15's windows. Once 15 is clean, I move all the supplies back to the shop, and wait for the guests to arrive. Check-in is at 11am, so I end up cleaning the shop's counter and floors, and I sell two smoked trout in the time that I spend waiting, and some poor soul buys a Twix bar that is definitely expired. <laughs> it's a few minutes before 11 and I hear the door opening. I had been napping since no one had come by for an hour. With a bit of a start, I look up, and to my absolute horror, it is Pajama Beard. He's clutching something made of paper in his left hand, and in his right, a breakfast burrito with more cheese than anything else. There was a good three quarters of the burrito left, and I watch in shock as this hog eats it in three huge bites. <laughs> Looking him over, it almost seems as though he somehow gained weight. I know he has definitely packed on some pounds since I first met him, but I could have sworn he was heavier than he was even just three days ago. My nose is then promptly hit with the same unholy scent, and it takes all my willpower not to throw up the rabbit stew that I ate for breakfast. Pajama Beard. Hello, October. Fancy meeting you here on such a fine day. He's spewing out chunks of his breakfast burrito while saying this. OP, hello, Pajama Beard. Are you here to check in? Pajama Beard. If only I was, that would be divine, but your reservations are full until next month. Probably because there is someone so beautiful working here. OP, I'd call Dan more handsome than beautiful. <laughs> And if you're not here to check in, then I can't talk. I'm working and guests are set to arrive shortly, so whatever it is, please make it snappy. He looks at me then, somewhat disappointed, and proceeds to stretch his left hand out to me. The piece of paper I saw was not actually a paper at all, but a sweat-marked sealed envelope. Pajama beard. For you, my lady. <laughs> I right about lost it here. No one had ever said that to me before, and it made me want to crawl inside a hole and die. 
I then proceed to reluctantly pluck the letter from his greasy palm using the thumb and index finger pinch technique. OP. Thank you, Pajama Beard. Now, uh, I have to get back to work. Before Pajama Beard could say anything, his stomach made the loudest sound I have ever heard a stomach make. You probably could have heard it even standing outside at the pond. That's how loud it was. Pajama Beard laughing slightly. <laughs> I guess four wasn't enough. <laughs> OP, four what? Pajama Beard. Four burritos. I should have gotten six, just in case. And maybe three extra hash brown orders instead of two. The burrito I had watched this guy consume was not a small burrito. It looked like a full one pound burrito, and that means he would have already eaten four pounds of burritos plus three servings of hash browns, if I'm correct in assuming that he got one hash brown with his feast and ordered two extra. Or maybe it was one hash brown per burrito plus two. Either way, at a minimum, this guy had consumed at least five pounds worth of food just for breakfast. And he was still hungry. Picking out a bit is fine on occasion, like on holidays, for example. But having a feast every day is not healthy, as if you couldn't tell by the way he looks. <laughs> Lucky for me, before I could think about this insanity anymore, I already had a young couple appear in the shop doorway. My unknowing hero's presence would now save me from the jaws of this obese wolf man. <laughs> Pajama Beard looks up and then looks towards me, but I'd already begin pulling out the guest book and talking to them. With a big huff, he waddles out, causing the little shop to rock a little as he went. I get the couple checked in, they must have seen the disgust on my face, and they tried to make conversation with me to make me feel better. Their kindness isn't lost on me, and I thank them for showing up when they did and being so nice, and I show my gratitude by giving them the friends and family discount on their entire stay. In the back of my mind, however, is the envelope, and how it's still sitting on the counter corner in the bait shop. I want so badly to just leave it there, but I'm also an extremely curious person, and this time, my curiosity got the better of me. It's a good time later when I sit down to eat my dinner, I found some really nice porterhouse at the Vons and Bishop, and I prepared one of them for dinner along with a baked potato and pan-fried asparagus. I sit at my little table eating, and before me sits the beard's envelope. Using my fishing knife and a napkin, I dissect the envelope, revealing a piece of paper which contains some of the most cryptic and disturbing things that I have ever read. I'm sitting there eating my steak, reading the world's most delusional love letter, now, I wish I would have taken a picture of it, but it honestly probably violated Reddit's guidelines for even an adult post. Lines like, I'll make you come until you bleed. And, if your boyfriend tries to get between us, I'll slice his head off and feast on his corpse. Are forever etched into my memory. I would have taken that shit straight to the police if it wasn't for the fact that he was smart enough to type it and not handwrite it. And I doubted anyone would actually believe that I received this and that it wasn't some sort of cry for attention or a hoax. But looking back on it, I think the biggest reason that I didn't do anything is because it didn't scare me. I honestly found it kind of funny, and I recall laughing while reading it because of how bold and faked his claims and threats were. In that moment, I felt stupid for ever being unsettled by this guy. And that night, I returned my revolver to its hiding spot in my truck, and even left my doors unlocked. If this fucker wanted to try something with me, I wanted to see him try. The next morning, I woke up nice and early, and lit a campfire outside to cook some bacon and eggs on. But my real motive wasn't to have a rustic breakfast, I just used that as an excuse to have a fire to burn Pajama Beard's fucking comical letter and have it contribute to something useful while doing so. However, much like my patience of Pajama Beard's bullshit, the love letter was nothing more than ash in a matter of seconds. In the next installment of the Pajama Beard encounters, we'll skip forward a bit to my boyfriend's visit and Pajama Beard's jealous fury. Edit. My plan was to skip forward a bit to avoid spamming the subway stories, the plan being to release only two more. However, if enough of an interest is expressed here, then I can post more to my personal page, so please let me know. Pajama Beard, Encounter 6, The Finale, Part 1. The Boy, The Knife, 
and the beard. <laughs> the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. <laughs> My boyfriend comes to visit me in pajama beard. Can't handle seeing his lady with a Chad. Then I do something that probably should have gotten me arrested. The cast, me slash OP, October, 17-year-old female who loves fishing and food and is also the unwanted recipient of Pajama Beard's affections. Matt, my 20-year-old boyfriend, who we'll just call Matt for this story. Rainbow Trouts, since they appear in every story, I guess they're technically part of the cast. Pajama Beard, PB, a 22-year-old male werewolf who has decided that I am the object of his desires. And Dan, my boss and owner of the lodge and cabins. Important note, for the sake of keeping the length of this series reasonable, I've skipped forward in time about four weeks. Nothing major occurred during this time. Of course, I had some interactions with Pajama Beard, but none of them I feel would be worthy of their own parts. My plan is to make a compilation of these mini-encounters and make a part five and a half, and then post that to my personal page. It should be up by the 28th, but it may take more time just due to the fact that it's a lot to compile. But I've written too much already, so relax and enjoy the read. It's been four weeks since I received the love letter from Pajama Beard, and as stated above, what occurred in that time wasn't really very important. Just a few minor run-ins that change nothing about Pajama Beard or myself, minus the fact that Pajama Beard has gained considerable weight in this four-week period, as he claims he is depressed because you rejected me, so food is my only comfort. <laughs> Good. Eat yourself to death, bro. However, emotional manipulation has no effect on me, and my hatred for this land whale never ceases or lessens. I woke up at 6am, and I'm eager to get the day started. Today is the day that Matt is coming up to visit me, and since I haven't seen him in roughly two months, I'm very excited. I had gone down to town the evening before and called him. I confirmed that his directions were correct and verified where exactly I would be to meet him in town the following day. While I was down there, I drove into Bishop and stocked up on some groceries. I make myself breakfast and watch the sunlight hit the glacier from the small picnic table at the pond. It is going to be a beautiful summer day. Since the drive from where we reside is about four hours, and Matt's plan was to leave at 6 a.m., I still have about three hours to wait until I should be down in town at the little restaurant, which was our designated meetup spot. I bring out my casting pole and rig up a fly, after an hour and a half of trying, I'm successful in catching one of the native brook trout that had somehow found its way into the pond. After that, I head back to my cabin and swap out my rod. While eagerly watching the clock, I fish for around two more hours. I catch five nice rainbows and have just enough time to get them back to my cabin and put them in a bucket of water. At that, I jump in the truck and wave goodbye to Dan as I go. I'd taken four days off for Matt's visit that week, so... Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I'm so excited to see him again as I head down the mountain that I didn't even think about the black BMW that drives past me. I should have paid more attention. I get down to town about 30 minutes early. I've driven this road for two summers now, and though it usually kills two drivers every summer, I've gotten pretty good at driving it and can descend in about seven minutes. I end up sitting around in my truck on my phone catching up with what has happened in the last two months that I've been working. Though I have used my phone roughly once a week to call Matt and my family, I haven't really looked at the news at all. As it turns out, the world isn't really any different than the one I effectively left. I end up waiting about 45 minutes total, and Matt finally arrives in his little Nissan Frontier. After a good makeout session and a whole lot of hugging, we sit to eat lunch and catch up. I tell him about everything that's happened with Pajama Beard, including the love letter. And I can tell he's pissed. Now, Matt is the polar opposite of me. He's a lover, not a fighter. He's a big old teddy bear and total cuddle bug. He can also be a little bit needy and overprotective, but I love him just the same. I switch the topic to a bear that I had seen the week prior, and the anger drains from his face. He really likes bears, so it's my go-to topic of distraction. <laughs> After a while, we pay for the meal and head back up the hill. Since his truck is shit at scaling inclines, we take mine. He parks his at a trailhead at the base of the hill, and we head up. The drive goes uneventfully, and the look on his face is a mix of terror and wonder 
as he stares down the sheer cliffs at the beautiful stream below as well as the Owens Valley. It looks like something out of High Plains Drifter. We get up the hill, and I take him to meet Dan. After a while of chatting with him, I give him the tour and show him around the cabins. As we head back towards the last cabin, 18, I notice something that wasn't there that morning. It was the black BMW that I had seen on the road. Pajama Beard's black BMW. Matt senses the change in my mood and says, Matt, hey, let's go. You can take me fishing. Sound good? Too late. The behemoth has already spotted us and is moving as fast as he can to engage us. OP. God, I fucking hate this guy. Matt, is that Pajama Beard? OP. Yeah. Pajama Beard then dramatically opens the cabin door, and on his head is a black fedora with a red skull and crossbones on it. He takes slow motion, dramatic steps towards us. The stairs buckle under his massive frame. With each step he takes, they scream in agony. He must have thought he looked like a total badass, but in reality he looked like a beach whale desperately trying to roll over back into the sea. <laughs> Pajama Beard. Hello, my beautiful she-wolf. His fedora is covering his eyes as he says this. Pajama Beard. And you. He snaps his head up, revealing his eyes in which he has clearly inserted vermilion contacts. Pajama Beard. You, the one who's stolen my love. You, the one who has defiled her with your filthy hands. You who has... Matt cuts him off. Dude, listen. I don't know what the hell you're on about, but she's already told you that she doesn't want you now, or ever. So why don't you do us a favor and fuck off? As an attempt to rub more salt into the wound, I pull Matt in for a nice long kiss. Right before we can really get going, I feel a hand push he and I apart, and this hand had pushed not just me, but my right breast. I open my eyes to see Pajama Beard standing between us. His back is to me and he's facing Matt. Now, there's only one person on God's green earth I let touch in any way, and that is Matt. No one touches me twice and fucking gets away with it. That's when I do something that I almost regret, almost being the key word there. In that moment, I reach down for the thing that's always at my side, my survival knife. The exact brand and model of knife that I own, it's an oldie but a goodie. Leads to an eBay link that's dead, by the way, <laughs> or else I'd show you the picture. I remove the knife from its sheath and move it to my left hand, my non-dominant one. I approach Pajama Beard from behind. He's in the midst of trying to fight Matt. Then with my right hand, I clap his mouth shut. His skin and smell were foul, but I was too enraged to care. I then bring my left hand up, knife still in hand, and I turn the blade towards him, allowing the cold steel to graze his flabby neck. OP? Yeah, you know what that fucking is. So why don't you listen to him and fuck off, or... This time I take the dramatic pause. Perhaps you'd like me to demonstrate my cutting skills. You can't be that different from a trout, can you? Mind you, I'm saying all this as calmly and coolly as possible. I could just cut your throat and bleed you out and split you up the middle like a fish. And even better, you're up here miles from help, where phones don't work, and no one can tell your scream from a mountain lion's. The perfect place to... Matt shoots me a look. I reluctantly stop. Lower the blade and pull my hand away from Pajama Beard's mouth, shoving him as hard as I could away from both of us. He turns pale as a sheet, and it smells as though he may have pissed himself. Pajama Beard. You're a coward! He's shouting at Matt. Pajama Beard. Do with me on your honor by the pond at dawn. No outside influences. He looks to me then, and I sneer at him, and he quickly looks away. Pajama Beard. Well? Matt, groaning audibly here. Ugh, fine, I'll fucking fight you. Now screw off. Satisfied that his challenge for the lady's hand had been accepted, Pajama Beard swiftly turns away, making sure to stare at me with his stupid contacts in one last time. He then marches back up the steps into his cabin. Matt and I don't talk about what happened. We simply walk back to my cabin in silence. I grab my fishing stuff. He sits and watches, and we both say nothing of the incident. I think he could tell that I wasn't in the mood to talk about it at that time. We fished for the remainder of the day until twilight. He catches his first trout, and I couldn't have been more proud. 
I taught him how to clean it, and we have fried rainbow trout fillets and potatoes for dinner. We stay up late, looking at the stars. You can see the Milky Way from up there. After all, it's over 10,000 feet up. And after a while, we go to bed. Neither of us are in the mood to do anything. Both of us had been tired out by the day's events. And in the end, we just fall asleep in each other's embrace. But in the back of my mind, even before I fell asleep, one thought remained. Pajama Beard and Matt would fight tomorrow, and I would be forced to stand aside and watch. Stay tuned for the final chapter in the Pajama Beard Encounters. The Finale Part 2, Duel at Dawn. Pajama Beard Encounters, The Finale, Duel at Dawn. Matt and Pajama Beard duel for the lady's hand, and Dan has to intervene. All oh, spoilers! <laughs> the cast, me slash OP, October! 17-year-old female who loves fishing and food, also Matt's girlfriend. Matt, my boyfriend, and combatant number one in the blue trunks. <laughs> Rainbow trouts, they do appear in every story, so technically they are part of the cast. Pajama Beard, PB our morbidly obese lichen beard, and combatant number two in the orange speedo. <laughs> That's a horrible image. Dan is my boss and owner of the lodge slash cabins. The stupid rooster alarm clock goes off at 5.45 a.m., but neither of us wants to get up. Both of us know what the day has in store for us, and let's just say that we're not too eager to get it started. After a bit, though, I climb out of bed and hop in the shower, even after I finish, Matt is still laying down, and it takes me giving him a nice wet hair smack to get him up. I make breakfast, but advise Matt not to eat anything, just in case Pajama Beard by some miracle gets in a good gut punch. Matt agrees, but he makes sure to set aside a portion for himself. I made Duster Stew on the campfire outside. Duster Stew is a mixture of any and all leftovers that y'all have put together in one pot and heated over an open fire. Then stirred with a screwdriver. I make a bit more of a refined version, but the premise is still there. And yes, I do use the screwdriver. <laughs> What's with the screwdriver? I, I, I don't I don't understand. Oh well, one of those outdoor people things. After the stew is all said and done, we head out. The sunlight is flooding the mountaintops now, and it looks beautiful. Dawn is almost upon us. OP. Ready for your big fight, Matt? <laughs> yeah, actually, I've never been in a fight before. Oh, God. OP, wait, you've never been in a fist fight before? Matt, I got clothes in, like, second grade, but no, I've never been in an actual fight. OP, shit. Well, just put him in a headlock or something, then. It'll be gross, but that way you won't actually have to fight. Matt? Or maybe I should just keep jogging away from him or something to tire him out? OP, I wouldn't, because then he might think that you're conceding and try to do something unsavory with me. Matt, yeah, maybe you're right. I'll go with the headlock plan then. We make the short walk down to the pond. Into our utter shock, Pajama Beard is already there, waiting for us. He's abandoned his fedora, but still has the contacts. Something to note about the contacts. When I first saw them, I thought they were green. I'm colorblind after all. However, Matt later corrected me and insisted that they were bright red. So I'm just going with he still had red contacts in. Pajama Beard wastes no time in engaging Matt. I take up a spot at the pond picnic table, and the fight begins. I know they're saying things to each other, but they've moved just out of earshot, and I only catch snippets of what is actually said. Since Matt isn't generally an aggressor, it's no surprise that Pajama Beard ends up taking the first swing. His punch is almost as slow as his walk, and Matt doesn't have to do much more than take a good step back to avoid it. Matt proceeds to take a swing back. It's clumsy and far from elegant, but it does hit its pudgy mark. Matt worked in construction with his dad for a good two years before he started going to college, because I put a fire under his ass to go. So what he lacked in skill and grace, he more than made up for in strength. Pajama Beard's face contorts a bit. Matt's heavy punch clearly hurt. Pajama Beard swings again, except this time, it looks like he's going for more of a scratch than a punch. 
This makes contact along the side of Matt's face, and he flinches a little. Matt then, in an attempt to follow through with the plan, goes for the headlock. To my surprise, he's actually successful. And before I can clearly tell what happens, Pajama Beard is flailing about wildly. That's when Pajama Beard makes his smartest move of the entire fight. He pushes backwards against Matt and goes dead weight. They hit the ground hard. Matt was unable to clear himself completely of Pajama Beard's enormous mass, so his right side is just pinned under Pajama Beard's now uncovered stomach. Matt wiggles free, trying to kick Pajama Beard's gut off of him as he goes. They landed in the mud alongside the pond, and Matt's back is now totally caked in it. Pajama Beard must have worn himself out because he's unable to get himself up. He tries a few times, but he can't get his legs underneath him. His stomach is way too fat, and it's forcing his legs apart. Matt walks over toward me as Pajama Beard lays somewhat helplessly defeated. He asks somewhat jokingly, How did I do? OP, you look like an autistic chicken, but you got the job done, I guess. Matt, well, like I said, I've never actually been in a fight before, and I can't say I enjoyed it all that much. I mean, look at me. He turns, revealing the extent of the mud. Before I even have time to say anything in response to what I'm looking at, Pajama Beard shouts, Pajama Beard, Don't think it's over yet, coward! He then proceeds to hurl a mud ball in our direction, and it hits Matt with a smack in the neck, and a little bit gets on my sweater, and then all hell breaks loose. Matt is furious. He pounces with unprecedented grace on the beached whale like a mountain lion on an unsuspecting deer, and he begins punching him mercilessly. Pajama Beard is squirming, shouting, STOP! STOP! Causing mud and grassy debris to fly everywhere within a five foot radius. It gets to the point where I've seen enough, and I get up from the table and run over to pull Matt off of Pajama Beard. Right as I get there, I look away for a split second and see Dan running down the path from his cabin, hose in hand. I get the hell out of the way as he blasts them both with freezing water. Matt springs up and runs back over toward me to avoid being sprayed even more. Pajama Beard, however, is unable to get up and get away, so he gets blasted a while more while Dan yells. Dan, what in God's name is wrong with you two? This is a fishing pond, not a wrestling ring. <laughs> Eventually he turns off the hose and helps Pajama Beard up. Matt is staring at me with sorry eyes and says nothing. Dan then promptly scolds them both, telling them that they shouldn't fight like that in front of a young lady, and that they both ought to be ashamed. I remember him saying, This may be the woods, but that doesn't give you the right to act like animals. Matt apologizes, with Pajama Beard simply standing, staring at his nose. It looks dislocated, and his left eye is severely bruised. After Dan is finished, Pajama Beard grumbles something under his breath and waddles off. Dan then goes back up the path, but this time toward the shop and I have him leave the hose. I do my best to spray Matt off before he tracks mud into my cabin, then I make him strip down to his boxers so I can hang dry his soaking wet clothes. I send him to take a warm shower and tell him to eat his stew. I sit outside for a while after hanging his clothes on the line and reflect upon all the events that had led up to this one, and I end up chuckling to myself for a little while. After a while of quiet reflection on the steps to my cabin, Matt comes out to join me. There are some little scratches on his face, but nothing too bad. We sit on the steps together and have a good laugh. All seems right with the world again. I didn't see Pajama Beard again after that day. The last I saw of him was his black BMW leaving later that day. But after that, never again. The remainder of that week, I had a great time with Matt, making memories with him that outweigh any bad memory that Pajama Beard left with me. The rest of my work trip went by with grace, and before long I found myself packing up for home, but internally I longed to stay among the mountains that towered over the high plains. In the end, I think that there's something for everyone to learn about my experience, whether it be a lesson on how not to accept a rejection, or a moral about self-control. There is really something here for everyone. And if my recount of my summer experiences is enough to wake even one individual up to the flaws of their own behavior, then I will consider the time that I put into telling them well worth it. Until next time, Red October. God, I'm so glad that they finally got to engage in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> if that's what you call it. 
the fight is basically over. <laughs> Except the mud ball that cued him to uh, really get the ass beating that he, he truly deserved. And then I love the part where... <laughs> Where Dan runs out with the hose, and I could just imagine Pajama Beard's fat ass. He can't get up, so I just <laughs> spray him with the hose. I would have sprayed him for like five minutes straight until it was no longer funny. Every time he's like, please stop, you just spray him in the mouth so he can't talk. <laughs> That's good comedy, boy. Dang. What a story. What a story, Mark. Haha, ha, I did not hit her. <laughs> I will say that that OP truly knows how to tell a story. And Matt got some life experience out of it too, you know? He's like, okay, now I have been in a fight. <laughs> it was with a whale that didn't stand much of a chance, but hey, your your win rate is 100%. <laughs> I mean, these stories were posted a year ago, so I, I partly hope that we'll get some more eventually, but... At the moment, that is all that is listed on Red October's Reddit account. But hopefully it won't be the last that we hear. I mean, I don't I don't wish a neckbeard experience on anybody ever. But, you know, I, I like the way this author writes. So, <laughs> at least tell us more pajama beard stories. Please and thank you. I would also say please and thank you. Could you could you please like, comment, and or subscribe on my video? That would be totally awesome. Also check out the links in the description to Twitter, Discord, my other channel, and Patreon. And as always, I'd like to give a shout out to my beautiful patrons. We got Just Austin, Robert Waits, Dot Nathan, Crimson Albedo, Lady Nix, Radam and Cisco, and the OG, oldest of all, Nico the Legend. I appreciate you guys helping me live the dream. We are halfway to a thousand subscribers, which will be monetization and will also help me to, to continue living the dream. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you to anyone who has subscribed and helped me out with that goal thus far. Keep yourselves safe out there. Wear your masks. Wash your hands. Shit's really real. <laughs> just just do your best to always keep yourself safe. Okay? Promise me that. Because you are worthy. You are loved. And you definitely <laughs> Definitely deserve it. So I will see you in the next one, friends. And until then, bye bye. And I'm eager to get the get. And I'm eager to get the get the gay started. <laughs>